Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Anupama Chaudhary Devgan, your physiology faculty, and I'm here to discuss the physiology questions asked in NEET PG 2025. Now, what is my opinion of the kind of questions which have been asked in the exam? These questions are definitely conceptual. They were clinical, they were applied, they were integrated questions. So what I insist on in my classes is that focus on concept building. Once your concepts are clear, as far as physiology is concerned, that it is possible to integrate with other subjects such as pharmacology or medicine. So let's have a look at the kind of questions which were asked. The first one says, which point on the VQ line is indicative of pulmonary thromboembolism completely occluding the blood flow? Now, VQ line is something which I discuss extensively in my class. So my students will be familiar with this graph. Now, um, this graph says when the VQ ratio is 1, the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen is 100 and the alveolar partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 40 millimeters of mercury. Now, as the VQ ratio increases, that means VQ ratio becomes more than 1. What does that mean? That means the ventilation in is in excess of the perfusion. The values of the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen in CO2 will move towards point B and finally towards point A. What is happening at point A is, at this point, perfusion is zero. If perfusion is zero, now the VQ ratio will be equal to infinity. Anything divided by zero, the quotient will be infinity. Now, if the perfusion is zero, the composition of the alveolar air will be similar to dead space air. What is dead space? Dead space is the volume of air which does not participate in respiratory exchange. So if perfusion is zero, there is no respiratory exchange. So the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen CO2 will be similar to dead space air very high partial pressure of oxygen, 150 millimeters of mercury, and very low CO2. If the VQ ratio becomes less than one, that means now the ventilation is less than the perfusion. In other words, now the blood is being inadequately ventilated. In this case, the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen CO2 will move towards point C and point D. At point D, ventilation is zero, VQ ratio is equal to zero. At this point, the composition of the alveolar air will be similar to mixed venous blood. There is no ventilation. So therefore, the alveolar air will be in equilibrium with the partial pressure of the gases in the venous blood. Now, this question says pulmonary thromboembolism, complete occlusion of blood flow, perfusion is zero, VQ ratio is infinity, this will coincide with point A on the graph. Let's look at the next question. Now, this says, which of the following actin myosin cross bridge pair correctly represents point C? Now, what is point C? Firstly, what is this graph? This graph is the length tension relationship, or what is also known as the Frank Starling's law. And what is this length tension relationship? It says, more the initial length more is the tension generated but up to a physiological limit beyond which further increase in initial length decreases the tension generated now what is point c point c is the initial length at which the tension generated is maximum the initial length at which tension generated is maximum is known as the optimum length and this optimum length corresponds with the sarcomere length of 2 to 2.2 or 2.3 microns that means if the sarcomere length is between 2 and 2.2 microns the tension generated will be maximum now at optimum length there is a maximum overlap between actin and myosin there are maximum number of actin-myosin cross bridges. If the length of the sarcomere goes beyond the optimum length, 
there is overstretching. So less number of actin myosin cross bridges are going to be formed. If the length of the sarcomere is less than the optimum length, then the actin molecules, actin filaments tend to overlap each other. So again, less will be the total number of actin myosin cross bridges. So in this case, the actin myosin arrangement which corresponds with the optimum length is C. D is overstretching and A and B, there is overlap of the actin over each other, decreasing the total number of actin myosin cross bridges. Some parameters were given and you had to identify which is the acid base disturbance here. PCO2 was 66, normal is 40, this is a high PCO2. pH, which should be between 7.38 to 7.43, this is at 7.21, pH is low, this is acidosis, and this corresponds with respiratory acidosis. Unfortunately, I do not know the complete stem, but I do know these values, and therefore this is a case of respiratory acidosis. Uh, you have to look at Rome in respiratory opposite. What is going to be opposite? pH and the PCO2. If pH is low and PCO2 is high, that is respiratory acidosis. If pH is high and PCO2 is low, that means it is respiratory alkalosis. ME, metabolic equal. Here you have to look at pH and bicarbonate. More the pH, more bicarbonate. That would indicate a metabolic alkalosis. Low pH, low bicarbonate will indicate a metabolic acidosis. A 25-year-old student is trekking in Leila Dark based on the physiological response to high altitude, which is the most likely primary acid-based disturbance in his blood. And this again is something which I love to discuss, high altitude physiology. So the moment you go into a high altitude area, there is a hypoxic hypoxia. This will stimulate the peripheral chemoreceptors, that is the carotid and the aortic bodies. There is an increase in the rate and the depth of ventilation. When there is increase in rate and depth of ventilation, we say there is increase in total ventilation and increase in alveolar ventilation, which now causes a CO2 wash out. And that will result in a respiratory alkalosis. So this is going to be the primary acid base disturbance. A respiratory alkalosis. Please remember the PCO2 levels are inverse to the alveolar ventilation. More the alveolar ventilation, less the CO2 level, less the alveolar ventilation, more will be the PCO2 level. A 30 year old travels to high altitude at a height of 3400 meters. He develops confusion, headache, and cerebral edema. What could be the probable cause? Now, in high altitude, there is low PO2 in the atmosphere and what is the effect of low PO2? It causes a cerebral vasodilation and that is responsible for the headache. So low PO2 causing a cerebral vasodilation. Low PO2 does not cause a cerebral vasoconstriction. H plus cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, does not cause a cerebral edema. High PCO2 causes a cerebral vasoconstriction. No, it causes a cerebral vasodilation. So here the answer is the low PO2 of the atmosphere causes a cerebral vasodilation. And that in turn causes the headache. In a regular 28 menstrual 28 day menstrual cycle, what are the hormonal levels typically observed between 21 and 25 days of the menstrual cycle? Again, this most famous diagram. So between 21 and 25 days of the menstrual cycle, as you can see, high progesterone, high estrogen, but very low FSH and LH. And that's exactly what we are going to answer. High estrogen, high progesterone, low FSH and low LH. Where does the estrogen and progesterone come from? From the corpus luteum. And the negative feedback effect, reducing FSH and LH levels. 
The following Starlings forces were recorded in the capillary, the capillary hydrostatic pressure, which is the major push force, PC. This is 18 millimeters of mercury. The colloid osmotic pressure of the capillary, that is the pull force, is 27. The PI is what we have to find out. And the pi I is, has been given as 7 millimeters of mercury. What is the net pressure? The net pressure is the formula PC minus pi C minus PI plus pi I. You have been given, you have been given these values here. PC is 18, pi C is 27. We have to find out PI and pi I is 7. Net pressure is 0 because it says there is filtration equilibrium and there is no flow. So there is no fluid formation. So the net filtration pressure is zero. So what is going to be my answer? PI is 18 minus 27, which is minus nine plus seven. This will be minus two. So my answer is minus two millimeters of mercury. There was a question on ileal resection exact stem, the exact options, I do not know. But I do know that if the question is an ideal resection, that means the answer has to be B12 deficiency. Because what is absorbed in the distal ileum are number one, number one B12, and number two, the bile acids. 90% of the bile acids are absorbed in the distal ileum. So ileal resection will give, uh, sorry, Ileal resection will cause a B12 deficiency and B12 needs to be replaced. If the blood glucose increases two to three times normal and stays elevated for some time, what will be the pattern of insulin release? Does it rise rapidly and fall rapidly? Does it rise gradually and fall gradually? Uh, the third option we do, do not know. The fourth one says the insulin rises, shows a slight fall and remains elevated, maintaining a steady concentration. And that's exactly what happens. There is an initial sharp rise in insulin. This is the uh, insulin which is already synthesized and stored in vesicles. The second phase of insulin release is the new insulin which is being synthesized. And that is exactly the pattern of insulin release which is going to be seen. So my answer here is insulin rises, shows a slight fall and remains elevated, maintaining steady concentration. Remains elevated till the blood glucose is remains high. Once the blood glucose reduces, the insulin will also reduce. Increase in which of the following hormones is responsible for hyperpigmentation in Addison's disease? Now in Addison's disease, there is decreased secretion of mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids, and this in turn causes increased ACTH, adrenocorticotrophic hormone. Now, ACTH itself has MSH activity, melanocyte stimulating hormone activity, and that is what is responsible for the hyperpigmentation in Addison's disease. So the answer here is going to be ACTH. Now, please remember, whenever ACTH levels are normal, there is no hyperpigmentation. It's only when it becomes in excess that the MSH activity of ACTH becomes manifest and you get hyperpigmentation. So these were the questions in the NEAT PG 2025. If you have any queries, please get in touch with me on my Telegram channel, and that is Dr. Anupama's Physiology. Or you can get in touch with me on Instagram, Dr. Anupama's Physiology. My email is Dr. Anupama Devgan at gmail. Thank you and all the best.